Welcome to the unplanned week three of the Daddy Issues series. I really thought I really thought this was going to be a two week series and have it wrapped up, and I just didn't get to everything that we needed to get to. I mean, Wickenburg uh, Jet is the one that set up the studio. I'm having a proud dad moment. Speaking of the Daddy Issues thing, I'm having this proud dad moment. He's 13 and he's the one that set everything up. Um, I really, I really do. I appreciate Jacob and the role that Jacob's taken in Jet's life, helping him mentoring him on stuff like this and it's funny that jet is so excited about it and so anyway um starting matthew chapter 13 verse 44 and this is jesus telling a parable and jesus had this history of telling stories that at a glance you thought you understood it and then years later you hear the exact same story and life has brought you to a new place and the exact same story the exact same words have a different meaning um this is one of those verse 44 says the kingdom of heaven it was like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then, in his joy, went out and sold all he had and bought that field. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. What he's saying is, very clearly is, that when you find what is the most good, you sacrifice everything else for the highest good. That doesn't mean what I thought it meant. I thought we were talking about treasure. I thought we were talking about pearls. I thought we were talking about land and sales and sacrifice. And we are. The problem with this is that the deeper you go into it, the more that it means. Let me give you an example. It could mean that there's a gap between what is and what could be. And when you find the thing that bridges the gap, you sell everything and you buy it. It could mean that there's a gap between what you have and what you need. And if you could just bridge the gap between what you have and what you need, then things would be okay. I miss, I miss this about being younger. I'm not one that looks back on my youth like with fond memories. And well, I wish I was younger, but this is one thing. I, I've enjoyed aging. I'm enjoying aging except for this one thing. I miss the confidence that comes with thinking that solutions are only one thing away. Everything would be fine if it was just for that one thing. That's what you say when you're young and stupid. One thing would fix it all. If I just had that one thing, I miss. And the thing is, here's the thing. If you believe that all life's problems could be solved with one single thing, what wouldn't you do to get it? You would sell everything to solve that one problem. But here's the sorrow that comes with aging. You bridge a few of those gaps and you realize Life is far more complicated than that. Life is so much more complicated than one singular solution solving everything, which means this, you can spend everything to build a bridge over the wrong gap. And you get there and the solutions that you thought would be there aren't there, but now you've spent everything that you had to get there. Now you're no better off than you were. You actually don't have any solutions, but you have all the resources are gone. You climbed a ladder only to discover it was leaned against the wrong wall. But now you're at the top of the ladder and you don't have any more resources. You're like, man, this is starting off really uh, uplifting and encouraging. <laughs> Jordan Peterson talked about what does it mean to want something. Everybody's geared towards wanting something. But the thing about the definition of want is if you're willing to sacrifice for it. If you're not willing to sacrifice for it, you didn't really want it. If you're willing to sacrifice, that's the proof that you want something. And we're geared to think of it that way. And when we're young and when we're more naive, we're far more willing to sacrifice. First of all, we don't have as much. And we're way more optimistic. We're by nature more optimistic and we don't have that much to sacrifice. The real gap is far more complicated. Let me tell you what I've, I, I know you guys have heard me say this. I'll be 40 this year. And the next time you listen to this, I'll be even older than that. The gap is almost never between what you have and what you want. Almost never is it that easy. It's usually, the gap is usually something more along the lines between what you want and what you should actually want. <laughs> Older people are laughing. Younger people are scratching their heads. I can just feel it. Older people are like, boy, that's the truth. And young people are like, what does that mean? The gap between what you want versus what you should want. Because what you actually want is almost never what you should actually want. What you know, here's one. What about the gap between what you know and what you think? Because sometimes we have 
so much unearned confidence on what we think because we've never had to prove it. We have this theory that this would be the, this is what you should do. This is what I would do until you have an experience. And then you go, I thought I knew this. Turns out I just thought that because there's a gap between what I think and what I know. And here's the fun of this as we're just continuing down this road of nihilistic suffering for a moment. There's no pause button. The minute you discover like, well, I bridged this gap and that didn't work. Maybe next time I should just pause and think about this a little bit longer. That is true. But the problem is this. You will spend everything on something. Whew. I promise it turns around. We're not just going down a deep, dark hole like I'm doing good. Everything's fine. We're going to be okay. We're going to come out of this. and You're going to be okay. But for a moment, you will spend everything on something. You will spend every minute of every day on something. You will spend every second of every day on something. You don't get to pause it. You'll spend all your money on something. You go, I don't spend my money. I save it. Then you're spending it on saving it. You'll get to invest your entire heart into something, but you can't invest your heart into nothing. There's no pause button. So this idea of like, I was young and stupid and I went after everything with my whole heart. I won't make that mistake again. You can't not make that mistake. You will go after something wholeheartedly. You can't avoid it. It gets worse. <laughs> Stick with me. This isn't a church concept. This is just life. This is just people. If you're just listening to this, try to consider that what I'm saying might be true. If you're like, I don't believe what you believe. That's okay. That's okay. It's hard to argue with the logic of what I'm saying. You can't save your time. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. This is the prodigal son. This is another parable. Jesus is talking about a young man who guessed incorrectly. He, he built a bridge over a gap and it led him to nowhere. And here's the story of it. Verse 11, and he said, there was a man who had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me a share of the property that is coming to me to ask your father for your inheritance before the father dies is to wish your father to be dead. So he divided his property between them. He saw no value in his father. He saw his father as being a hurdle between what he had and what he wanted. If only my dad was out of the way. If only the restrictions that my dad enforces in my life were gone, then I could be happy. That's the gap between where I am and where I want to be. And if I could only get there, all my problems would go away. He sells everything. He sells his place in the family. He sells out his father. He sells his inheritance. He gains all this. And listen to this. Verse 13. Not many days later, the young son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. Young men, listen. Listen. You are, you are designed to go adventure. You are designed to go explore. You're, it's the little boys do this. If you put a sand pile in an arena, where's a little boy going to be? At the top of it. It's part of what it means to explore and be a young man. But, but careful because you can sell everything for the wrong field. Son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. He sold everything for his interpretation of travel, experiences, freedom, lack of control, like the lack of restrictions. See this story about the sell everything. The kingdom of God is like a field. When you find a treasure, you sell everything and you buy it. Here's the problem. If you don't know what treasure looks like, you might sell everything and buy the wrong treasure. This idea that Je God calls himself Jehovah Jireh. God will provide. It's a word we hear in church. It's a word that church people say. It's a word that the Bible uses to just, God will provide. Here's the problem. What if you don't trust God? You're still making a gamble. You're still taking a gamble. This used to be one of my fears. I think I still struggle with it. That my heavenly father doesn't quite get me. He doesn't quite really understand me. And I'm going to open this present. I'm going to do what he says. I'm going to live in obedience. And then I'm going to open this present. And it's going to be something that's like, oh, an avocado. Thanks. This concept that God will provide hinges heavily on the idea that God knows who you are and that he's a God who will reward you. You're like, that seems like a big gamble. Everything you choose is a gamble. Here's the other problem. You only get to give up everything once. <laughs> it's a scary thought. You, you gamble everything once, and then all you're left with is what you gambled on. You only get to give up everything one time, and then you're just left with whatever you gave it up for. There's a philosopher named Soren Kierkegaard. Soren Kierkegaard said this, and it stuck with me. I love it. I love it. He said, anxiety is the dizziness of freedom. Let me say it this way. 
Anxiety is when you don't know what to fully dedicate yourself to. Anxiety is that feeling when you've got options, but you don't know which one's going to get you where you want to go. How do you know? How do you know which gap gets the bridge? Because the bridge costs you everything. How do you know when you found the pearl? How do you know that you're not just squandering it for nothing? And then stories like this come along. Uh, Genesis 25 verses 29 says, Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew for I'm exhausted. So he comes in and he's hungry. I mean, this is not a permanent problem. This is a temporary problem. And he's holding on to the blessing of the family. He is the behor. He is the like the the inheritance holder for the family but he sees no value in it because he wants to be outside and he's just he's youthful and stupid and he doesn't see that what he has is valuable jacob said sell me your birthright now esau said i'm about to die so what use use is a birthright to me jacob said swear to me now so he swore to him and he sold his birthright to jacob oh this just keeps me up at night what if what i have is valuable and i lose it trying to pursue something that's more valuable how do i know the dizziness of freedom the dizziness of not knowing what is valuable and what's not what if i sell the field that's got the treasure in it what if i'm the guy that has the field of treasure you see what i mean it's my own personal hell it's my own personal idea of hell is that i burn a bridge of value i sell the the field how do i know what's valuable how do i know what to hold on to or what to get rid of Proverbs 4, there's a story. Um, there's a king in the Old Testament named King David, and he comes from nothing. He was the shepherd. He comes from nothing. And, and I love the story of somebody who's in a position of success, but that started in a lowly position and all the life lessons that they learn. And King David was definitely this. He becomes like one of the best warriors. He's the greatest warrior in the history of Israel. And he's raising his son Solomon. And this is one of the one of the instructions, this is the bedtime story that King David says, of all the things I've learned, I was a shepherd and now I'm a king. And let me tell you what's important. Let me tell you what a field with treasure in it looks like. Let me tell you what the pearl looks like. Proverbs chapter four says, do not forsake wisdom. She will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. This is King David talking to Solomon. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom, though it costs all you have. Get understanding. Do you hear what, what it costs you though? David is saying, I've been without and I've been with. I've been nobody and I've been somebody. I've been powerful and I've been weak. I've been healthy. I've been sick. I've been accepted. I've been rejected. I've lived it all. And even if it costs you everything, get wisdom and understanding. If you find yourself with nothing, but you've got wisdom, you've got everything. This is King David to Solomon. This is just a dad talking to his son. He says, this is what I've found. This is a value that I hold. If I could wish anything for you as my son, the daddy issues series here. It's like the dad saying, if I could wish anything for you, it's not wealth. It's not health. It's not success. It's not power. It's not influence. If I could give you anything, son, if I could give you anything of value, it would be wisdom, even if it cost you everything. Because wisdom is how you get it all back. There's an older guy. When I was a kid and he told me this, I thought it was so interesting. He was a multimillionaire. Hey, when you're 15, you don't have anything. Somebody who's a multi-billionaire, there's no difference between a multimillionaire and a bajillion gazillionaire. It's like immeasurable amounts of money. He said, I've lost everything three times. And I got it all back every single time because I know how to make money. He goes, I'm not worried about it. I know how to make money. What? I just thought that was such an interesting concept. He was never afraid. If it, Why? Because... In his life, in his journey, he learned what a field with treasure in it looked like, and he knew how to find it. Wisdom knows what pearls look like. I'm going to compare it to money, and this is not a financial lesson. This is not how to get rich, but let me just tell you this. It would be like having an unlimited, you know, like the Amex black cards that have like the unlimited. You could, you could buy a private jet on an Amex black card, and, and they, it clears. It would be like you find yourself homeless, You've given up everything. You gave up your house. You gave up all of your financial possessions. You gave up your car. You gave up your money. You gave up your bank accounts. You gave up your horses. You gave up your truck and trailer. You gave it all up in exchange for what? The Amex black card. Well, then it was a good trade because with that, you could buy it all back. Strictly talking financially for a second. King David is talking to Solomon. And he's going, if you ever see one of these, buy it. 
If you come across wisdom, no matter what it costs you, no matter what you have to give up, wisdom, grab it. Solomon goes, what does it look like? King David's like, you'll know. You'll know. If you ever come across wisdom, no matter what the price tag is, it's worth it. So, prodigal son says the opposite. He says, dad, your advice is of no use to me. What you are in my life is of no value to me. Give it to me, and I'm going to go spend it. Death to the restrictions. I'm going to go to 1 Kings verse 3. So now what happens is King David dies. Solomon takes everything that King David taught him, and you can tell he never let it go. This is an interesting thing to me because it says that he still kept going to the high places and making sacrifices there. And that's, I mean, that's a whole different sermon. But it says it was there that God speaks to Solomon. He has a dream. And it says, at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God asked, God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Boy, that's a mouthful. God says, all right, you're the king now. I'll give you anything that you want. I will give you a bridge to any gap. You tell me what you want, I'll give it to you. It's a bridge to anywhere. The Bible tells us that King Solomon's answer was wisdom. That was his answer. But you got to know the backstory. The backstory was that it was like his dad had prepared him for this. Of like, if you ever see this, sell everything and get it. And God goes, I'm offering you everything. Whatever you want, anything. Now, there's a caveat here. Because remember, go back to the parable where it says the man sold everything to buy the field. There was an expense. There was a cost. Same here. Same here. God goes, I'll give you anything that you want. Think about everything Solomon had to say no to. We don't really have enemies right now. There's nobody that's threatening our, our lives in this current moment yet. We don't really know what it feels like to have enemies. Solomon had almost nothing but enemies. He could have said, all right, wipe out everybody who's against me. That's what I want. I mean, this is your genie. You got one wish. He could have said, uh, guarantee me a long life. Guarantee that I'll, I'll live forever. Because, I mean, anything. And he remembers what his dad says. The prodigal son says, dad, your value is of nothing to me. Here, take it all. Give me my stuff. Solomon goes, wait, my dad told me what, my dad prepared me for this. He goes, wisdom. I know this one. Give me wisdom. Because wisdom is how you get all the other things back. Verse 10, listen to this. Listen to this. God says, the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for a long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, moreover. Because here... Think of it, try to think of it this way. Try to do me a favor, and I'll try to do the same thing. Try to try to think of what I'm about to say and really let it just sink in. There's a gap between what we want and what we should want. And somehow David, King David, as a dad in his wisdom, prepared Solomon, don't value what you want. Ask God what you should want. Align yourself to God's priorities. Take your life, see what the word says, and do your best to sacrifice what you want in trade for what you should want. Solomon goes, he goes, God goes, what do you want? And Solomon goes, I want what you say is valuable. Give me what you think I should need. That is somebody who had a healthy relationship with his earthly father, making this full transition to God going, I remember what it was like to have a, a dad who believed in me and prepared me for life. Would you do that for me? Now, listen, if you didn't have that, you still get to make that same request. I didn't have a dad that prepared me for life. Will you be a dad that does that for me instead? Give me what you think I should want. Bridge the gap between what I want and what I should want. God says, moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for. Wealth and honor so that in your lifetime, you'll have no equal among kings. Now, we put it in your plate because that's what we do here. That's what church is about. We try, to, we try to bridge the gap between where we are and where we ought to be. We try to connect the dots for people who want to aspire to something bigger, that want to be drawn upward into something greater. That's what, that's what we hope. We don't always get there, but here's what we hope. I want to remind you that you will spend your time every day on something. You will spend your money on something, even if that means saving or investing. You will invest your heart into something. You don't get to push the pause button. 
So how you view that makes all the difference. Listen to Luke 15. We're going to go back to the prodigal son for a second because his story wraps up in a neat way. Verse 14 says, And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. And when he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. If you've never heard this story, it's an interesting one. He squanders it everything. He lost everything. He spent it all. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will rise and go to my father. Remember, go back to what Jordan Peterson said, that willingness to sacrifice is the definition of want. That's the definition of what it means to want something. So it says that he lost everything. He squandered it. What a waste. There's another way to look at that. There's another way to view what happened is that he spent everything to learn who his father was. He spent all of it for better perspective on who his father was. Because listen to this. He could not have put his dad in a worse position. I wish you were dead. You're dead to me. Give me my inheritance. I'm gone. He goes. He spends it all. He goes and he trades everything for this realization. Listen. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. He lost everything or it cost him everything. That moment cost him everything for this realization of this value of his father, of who his dad really was. Think of it this way. If you don't have it, this is what it means to trust the story. This is what it means to trust that God is involved in your life. That even though you don't see it, that God is at work in your life. This is what, this is what that looks like. Sometimes if you don't have it, you don't need it. If you don't need it, you shouldn't want it. Sometimes not having it is all it takes for us to really want it. Sometimes the only reason we want it is because we don't have it. We are gap addicts. We never stop and consider that maybe God is at work in our lives and the things that we're having to give up are the price tag for becoming the person he wants us to be. Can I please repeat that? That feels right. That feels good. Sometimes the things that God takes out of our life is the price tag for us becoming the person that God wants us to be. But there's a gap between what we want and what we should want. What we should want is what he wants. What we do want is whatever it is that we think adds to our story. Genesis 37, we talked about this two weeks ago. Genesis 37, when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe. They take his robe. Now, you could say that it was stolen from him. You could also say he invests his robe into a story. They took him and they threw him into a pit. Coat was stolen. What child in his right mind would have chosen that? Sometimes the price tag is more than we would be willing to pay unless we want what we should want. Hope this is making sense. Genesis 39 says that Potiphar's wife steals his coat, tattles on Joseph, says he tried to attack me, steals his coat, there's a price tag, steals his coat back into the pit. Now, you could say twice Joseph found himself with nothing. Maybe you're here. Maybe you're sitting here going, I've invested all this time and all this work and and I've gotten nowhere. I've got nothing to show for it. I put all this effort in. I've done all this and I've got nothing to show for it. Cheer up, little buddy. Because sometimes, sometimes that's exactly where God finds us and allows us to accept what we should want versus what we already wanted. Can't bridge the gap. I can't make it work. This is what I want. I can't figure out how to get it. This is what I need. I can't figure out how to make it happen. We're lost in anxiety. We're lost in stress. But then when it all comes around, it says Solomon has offered everything, but he chooses one thing at the cost of everything else. God goes, anything. Solomon goes, anything? If I can have anything, I only want one thing. If you're really offering me anything, then I only want one thing. And by choosing one thing, I'm giving up everything else. Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, I love this. It says, your father knows what you need before you ask him. There's never a moment where God's like, oh, I forgot you're in prison. Shoot, I lost track of you. I love that at the end of Joseph's story, the story of Joseph who was sold into slavery. If you haven't heard this story, go look it up. Daddy Issues, week one. Sold into slavery. They stole his coat. Lied, betrayed, back into prison. Loses his coat again. 
when it all comes together, what was Joseph doing? He wasn't solving it. He wasn't fixing it. He was sitting there in prison where everybody else could have argued that they forgot about him. It says that God speaks to Pharaoh in a way that Pharaoh can't understand. Joseph is brought in. He explains Pharaoh the dream, the story of Joseph's life, of the unattractive cows, the attractive cows, the seven years, the famine, all of it. It's all a story of Joseph's life. Now listen to this. It's more personal. Ready? Genesis chapter 4. Remember, the theme of Joseph's life was give up your coat, thrown in a pit. No one would choose that. No one would want that. But what it brought into Joseph's life was wisdom. Every coat that he lost was an investment into wisdom. Every hole he was thrown into, it was an investment into wisdom. Every time someone lied about him, it was an investment into wisdom. Every time that things didn't go his way, it was an investment into wisdom. And King David prepares Solomon. Even if it cost you everything and you get wisdom, it was a good trade. Joseph is going, wait a minute. I find myself in this position of wisdom, but it cost me everything. The word says, good trade. Ready? Genesis chapter uh, 41 so, so Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land. Because remember, Joseph interpreted the dream. Then Pharaoh took the ring from his finger, put it on Joseph's finger. And then what did he do? What did he do? It's so symbolic. It's so perfect. What was the theme of Joseph's life? Give up your coat, thrown in a pit. What happens here? He's pulled out of a pit and it says that Pharaoh gives him robes of fine linen. When God is ready to move, he's not limited by your gaps. When God is ready to move, actually, maybe this is the point of the whole sermon. Maybe this is the whole idea. There are no gaps. There are no gaps between point A and point B. Because when God's ready to move, he doesn't teach you how to build a bridge. He brings it to you. God moves heaven and earth to come to you right where you're at. It's that lost sheep. It doesn't say, and then finally he equips the little lamb with a GPS until he can find his way back. It says a shepherd pursues and comes and finds. And I think there are times where we are so exhausted because we're trying to solve it and fix it and figure out the puzzle. And I think whether you're a believer or not, whether you're a church person or not, we all suffer from this. How do I fix it? How do I solve it? How do I get what someone else has? Instead of going, what should I want? what would it cost me to live as though God was invested in my life? What would it cost me? I think it would cost me things like my willful anxiety, my willful worry, my willful control addiction, my willful rage or inferiority. Philippians 4.19 says this, and my God will supply all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. He's already got it. It's already there. You're not lost out of his will. I, I think that... It feels meaningful to me. It feels meaningful to me that when Solomon says, I can have anything, okay, I only want one thing. The prodigal son says, it cost me everything to learn who my father was. Joseph says, it cost me everything to learn who God was. That in our own lives, there is nothing stopping us. The Bible says that if you lack wisdom, ask. It doesn't say if you lack money. It's a little harder if you want more money. Doesn't say power. Doesn't say if you want more power, just ask. I'll give it to you. Doesn't say, God, I just want more influence. And God was obligated himself to anything in that regard. It does say, if you're lacking wisdom, ask and I'll give it to you. It's free. There is no gap between you and wisdom. And what wisdom does is it knows what pearls look like. It knows what treasures look like. It knows what value looks like. It doesn't make bad trades. It's the Amex card that opens the door to all the other things. God says, ask and I'll do it. What would it look like to have a good dad? It's a dad who teaches us the value of wisdom and then gives us wisdom no matter what it costs. No matter what we had to give up to get there, it's worth it. Let's pray. Lord, I just, I don't know how to make this make sense. I don't know how to tell somebody to give up what they want and replace it with what they should want. I can't demand it. I can't order that. I can't make anybody do that. But God, I know it matters. And sometimes it's the suffering, it's the breaking, it's the remodeling that brings us to a place where you go, just like the prodigal son, anything's better than what I've done. Anything that God's got for me is better than what I've got for me. Lord, teach us to live in the peace that says there are no gaps. Stress and anxiety is not the solution. But God, peace and love, and joy, and patience, and kindness, and goodness, and these things that say, whatever God's got for me, he will work it out. And no matter what it's cost me to get to here, if it brought wisdom, it was worth it. 
Help us to start to conceptualize you as a good father who's invested, deeply invested, a God who gives us robes back, a God who doesn't lose track of us in our dark times, in our dark seasons, but God, a God who's intimately and personally invested. Help us to live in that kind of confidence. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.